The basic functions of engineers have always been mobility, counter-mobility, survivability, general engineering, and topographic engineering. The priority of those functions changes depending on the nature of the war or the military operations associated with it. Simplicitly put, engineers facilitate the movement of friendly forces, impede the movement of enemy forces, and build those things needed to sustain the force. This has always been the case, regardless of the engagement, conflict, or campaign. The United States Army Engineer Regiment traces its beginnings to the American Revolution. General George Washington made a significant positive impact on the founding of the Corps in two ways. He recognized that warfare always required engineer support, and he recognized that military engineering was a science requiring formal education and training. You could take a group of people to the village green and drill them for two weeks and create infantry. You could not do that with engineers. While there were any number of individuals in the colonies who could build things, military engineering was something different. Washington understood this, and that understanding was critical in the ultimate formation of the Corps of Engineers. He asked the Continental Congress to authorize, on his staff, the position of Chief Engineer. On June 16, 1775, the Congress authorized the position of Chief Engineer. That date, June 16th, 1775 is the birthday of the Corps of Engineers. What is interesting about that date is that it is a full calendar year before the Declaration of Independence. That makes the Corps of Engineers and the Army older than the nation itself. In time, the colonies were able to secure the services of French engineers. Benjamin Franklin, the American minister to the French court, had, as one of his tasks, the chore of finding French military engineers who were willing to serve in the colonies. One of them, Louis du Portail, became Washington's chief engineer and served in that capacity for the rest of the war. Many consider du Portail as the father of the Corps of Engineers because du Portail succeeded in getting the Continental Congress to authorize engineer units and create a Corps of Engineers. He also laid the foundation for what would one day become the Engineer School. It was located on the Hudson River at a site called West Point. Louis du Portail's greatest accomplishment, though, was in the Siege of Yorktown. Du Portail used engineer tactics developed over a hundred years earlier to cut off Yorktown, which led to the surrender of Cornwallis and the end of the American Revolution. Under President Jefferson, engineers were used to survey and map the Louisiana Purchase. Their work was overshadowed by another group, Lewis and Clark, who received most of the credit for work that was actually done by Army engineers. As America's economy began to grow, we were once again thrust into war with Great Britain. The mission of the engineers during the War of 1812 was similar to that of the American Revolution, the construction of roads, field fortifications, and coastal defenses. The distinct difference between these wars is during the American Revolution, engineers were trained by foreign countries. But by the War of 1812, America was training its own engineers at West Point. The expansion of the United States to the West ultimately brought it into conflict with Mexico. The admission of Texas into the Union in 1845 precipitated hostilities with Mexico, leading to the Mexican War. Unlike the previous wars, this one was fought on foreign soil. The engineer mission changed dramatically for this war. Rather than focusing on building bridges and fortifications, engineers were used for terrain reconnaissance. Of note, during the Mexican War, in his march to Mexico City from Veracruz, General Winfield Scott came up to the Mexican Army, drawn up in line of battle. It appeared that his only option was a direct frontal assault. Being an intelligent commander, Scott turned to his staff engineer and told him to find a way around the enemy's flank. That engineer did a terrain reconnaissance and found a trail through the mountain. When he reported this, Scott told him to lead General Wool's brigade along that trail while engineers widened it for artillery. Wool's brigade fell on the Mexican flank and Scott won the battle. Scott's staff engineer was Captain Robert E. Lee. The outset of the Civil War led to a new task for engineers, that of bridging. The Civil War was fought on a large scale with the biggest armies the nation had ever amassed. 
These armies required an inordinate amount of supplies that traveled in wagon trains. The wagon trains could not simply forge rivers, so, therefore, the engineers were called upon to build bridges. Because many supplies moved by waterways, engineers had to be able to deny their adversaries from moving along them. They also continued with their mission of building fortifications. Another major accomplishment of the Corps of Engineers was the completion of the Washington Monument. After the monument was only one-third complete, the company contracted to build it ran out of money and work halted. Years later, Congress called upon the Corps of Engineers to complete the project. Not only did they complete the project, but the supervising engineer realized that the original company had laid the foundation on clay rather than bedrock. He had to undermine three-quarters of the monument's base, ensuring the entire foundation was set on bedrock. The engineers had other, rather unusual projects in the years before the First World War. One example is the French attempt to build a canal across Panama. The French ran into tremendous problems, losing many lives as well as money. In 1904, they sold all of their property rights and equipment to the United States in return for $40 million. After the first two civilian engineers who were put in charge quit, Theodore Roosevelt appointed Lieutenant Colonel George Washington Gathels as the chief engineer on the canal. He, along with two primary engineer officer assistants, reorganized the project and completed it in 1914. The importance of the canal in either a political, economic, social, or military context cannot be measured. It ranks as one of the greatest building projects of the 20th century. World War I saw another major change to warfare, the use of machine power. Despite the availability of this new technology, engineers still relied heavily on their D-handle shovels. They were called upon to build roads and railways throughout the European theater. They continued their bridging missions by creating massive trestle bridges for the railways they laid. Another major factor in World War I was the use of trench warfare. Prior to World War I, the primary mission of the engineer was that of generalist, or general engineering, and topography. The need for a fighting engineer in the trenches resulted in the development of the combat engineer, a specialist in mobility, counter-mobility, and survivability. World War II was called by many an engineer's war. Many have seen engineers in World War II through images of bulldozers, steel pots, M1s, mine detectors, and demolitions. That is true, but it is only a part of the picture of what engineers did during World War II. In 1941, the Corps of Engineers was placed in charge of all military construction in the United States. By definition, Military construction included everything that was designed to support the war effort. Therefore, the Corps was responsible for training camps, such as Fort Leonard Wood, and the largest office building of its time, the Pentagon. After completion of the Pentagon, the supervising engineer, Colonel Leslie Groves, moved on to another task, the Manhattan Project. General Leslie Groves went on to build the atomic bomb. The project was a $2 billion effort. It was, without a doubt, one of the most complex wartime projects ever attempted. The level of secrecy alone was such that thousands of workers did not know what they were working on until years after the end of the war. This one engineering project changed the course of human history. The engineers contributed greatly to the war effort in Europe and the Pacific. They continued their bridging mission, building troop bridges and pontoon bridges. This gave way to more sophisticated techniques such as modular bridges and vehicle-launched bridges. The engineers also built many docks, employing the use of engineer divers to work on them. The combat engineers added the mission of handling landmines and developing techniques to identify and clear them. The nature of warfare did not evolve between World War II and the Korean War. Each of the traditional functions of the engineers came into play with the same order of magnitude, the engineers in Korea used the same tactics and techniques, the same equipment, and the same basic procedures as those who had fought several years before. The major difference with Korea was the near constant shift in operations. Because of the rapid transition between offensive and defensive operations, 
engineers were called upon to build bridges, only to be called weeks later to destroy them. At the end of combat operations, the post-armistice period from 1955 to 1956, engineers were involved in substantial national assistance, nation-building missions. This included such civic action projects as schools, water systems, commercial roads, hospitals, and even churches. In many ways, Vietnam was like Korea. During the Vietnam War, Europe was still the dominant focus of strategic planning due to the growing threat of the Soviet Union and the ongoing arms race. In addition, it was a war during peacetime. There was no mobilization of the nation's resources because our nation was at peace. Even for the engineers, a large part of the regiment was working projects that had no bearing to the fighting in the Far East. Navigation and flood control dominated the civil works missions of the Corps. Environmental matters were starting to surface. The construction of facilities for NASA and the targeted landings on the moon stood in stark contrast to the image of an infantry patrol wading through a rice paddy. Following the end of the Cold War, the engineers were called upon in 1990 for operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Engineers built the temporary base camps in Saudi Arabia, preparing for the movement into Kuwait, and were instrumental in the reduction of obstacles blocking the path of American forces. At the end of combat operations, engineers used their expertise in demolitions to destroy unexploded ordnance. During the 1990s, U.S. forces were used as peacekeepers in the Balkans. Unlike operating in the desert of Kuwait, American forces were now required to move in wooded areas with many rivers. Engineers met the challenges of the Balkans in placing numerous bridges. The heavily wooded areas, along with decades of emplacement of landmines, made the mission of the engineers extremely difficult. With the onset of the global war on terrorism and the subsequent conflicts in both Iraq and Afghanistan, engineers were required to conduct all engineer operations simultaneously, making them some of the most important soldiers on the battlefield. Engineers bridged rivers, built barriers, fortified positions, laid down roads, conducted surveying, demolitions operations, and dynamic breaching. They gained additional assets in the use of engineer working dogs and were called upon for a new version of mobility operations, route clearance. Route clearance, the most dangerous mission of these wars, became the primary combat mission of the engineers. While construction units contributed significantly to combat outpost construction and route sanitation or route construction, because of their ability to accomplish nearly any task, engineers have been called upon in recent years to assist with natural disasters. Engineers were some of the first responders into New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, clearing debris and wreckage from the city. Engineer divers were called to Port-au-Prince, Haiti after a major earthquake to fix damaged docks. After a tornado destroyed much of the city of Joplin, Missouri, engineers were immediately dispatched to assist in the search for casualties and remained on site to assist with the cleanup. Whether the past or the present, the engineers have always been instrumental in the success of our nation. Engineers take on any task, no matter the level of difficulty or risk. They live their motto, essay ons. When all others have failed, let us try.